This is a lecture on equal protection. And in particular, it is a lecture on middle tier scrutiny in equal protection cases. <clears throat> now, what we want to know about middle tier scrutiny for examination purposes is number one, when do you use middle tier scrutiny? Secondly, what exactly is that scrutiny? What are the rules? And third, a whole bunch of examples because the bar questions, both multiple choice and essay questions, typically come from these blockbuster cases. So, step one is when do you use middle tier scrutiny? And the answer is here, two, two situations. One is if the classification scheme is based on gender. You're going to treat men one way, women another. If you're treating on the basis of gender, then we use middle tier scrutiny, which means uh, that the, what the government is doing must serve an important governmental interest and the rule must be closely fitted, narrowly tailored to achieve that important governmental interest. Use that when the criteria for grouping people is gender. You can treat women one way, men the other. Also, if you're going to treat illegitimate children one way and legitimate children the other. I think the term illegitimate sucks and a better term that some people are now using is non-marital children, a much preferred term. So the non-marital children versus the marital children, uh, the, uh, if uh, the criteria is you're treating the non-marital children one way and the marital children the other way, if that's your criteria, middle tier scrutiny. If you're treating women one way and men another, that's, uh, if that's your criteria, middle tier scrutiny. What does middle tier scrutiny mean? It means what we have here. The government interest has to be more than just a rational way uh, of achieving some lawful purpose. The government interest has to be more than just a lawful purpose. It has to be an important governmental purpose or a significant or a substantial. Any of those words will do. The word substantial is used a lot. Substantial governmental purpose. Uh, and that the rule must be narrowly tailored, closely fitted, substantially related, significantly related to achieving that important, substantial, or significant governmental interest. Closely fitted to achieve that interest. Uh, that is the rule. So what we know at this point then is that you use middle tier uh, uh, analysis, uh, uh, called quasi, some people call it quasi uh, strict scrutiny. Use middle tier scrutiny when the classification schemes based on gender or legitimacy and the scheme means closely fitted to achieve an important governmental interest. What are some of the important governmental interests? Well, here are some of them right here. Health, safety, remedial, we'll talk about that some more. The government raises armies. So these are all things which are important governmental interests. This is not a list of them. Uh, there is no such list. But every, whatever the governmental interest is in this legislation, you will have to evaluate it and make your claim about it being important or not important. Uh, the, uh, uh, an example of a governmental interest that's important, there was a, uh, the prison case which said uh, that we, no women guards would be hired, no women prison guards would be hired at this all-male prison facility. And so this is a case where we are clearly treating men one way and women another. And so the classification scheme is based on gender and not giving the women the jobs. Now, uh, in that case, the rule is that the government has to be trying to serve an important governmental interest. Well, the prison people said safety. Important governmental interest and what, they, what they're doing must be closely connected to that interest and uh, not giving women the job is arguably closely connected to maintain a safe prison under these circumstances. At least that was the argument. So important interests include things like health, safety, remedial. There's this one case where the Secretary of Agriculture, uh, the, uh, in fact it was uh, Califano versus Webster, uh, where uh, what the um, Social Security Administration did is say, look, 
when you calculate your Social Security benefits, that the amount that you are going to get depends on how much you were earning. And we, you can drop out your three lowest years of earning to calculate what your Social Security benefits are. But if you're a woman, you can knock off an additional three years of your lowest earnings to determine what your Social Security benefits were. So the women and the men were being treated differently. But the court said that was remedial because women had earned lower pay for years for doing the same work. And so this is somewhat remedial so they can get better Social Security benefits. So here, remedial measures are considered important. And what the government did was closely fitted to achieving that remedy. Raising armies, we draft men but not women. So these are some important governmental purposes. Our substantial ones include things like education. That's important, so this is not an exhaustive list. But you do need to know some things that are not important governmental interests. Administrative convenience is one of them. Uh, that come, came up in a case where uh, the, the, the uh, Missouri had a, a law that said if you are a widow because your husband died, we will presume you were a dependent on your husband and give you some death benefits. But if you are a man and your wife died first, so you are a widow were, then we will not presume that you were her dependent. You will have to prove it, that you were disabled or you were getting, uh, your, she was, you were her dependent. And so men and women were obviously being treated differently. Uh, the, and the court, and so what was the, so they treat it differently. You do two things. What is the governmental interest? Is it a substantial government interest? And is the rule closely fitted to it? What was the governmental interest in this case? Well, the government said our interest was administrative convenience. And the court said that is not an important or substantial governmental interest. Another example of something that is not a substantial government interest is carrying continuing stereotypes. You see this in this Mississippi school that I've told you about for women's school for nursing. And only women could go to this nursing school. And the court said, well, that really Letting women only into a nursing school is just really aimed at continuing a stereotype of the woman nurse. And that continuing that stereotype is not a substantial governmental interest. And then, uh, then don't forget to look to see if you have a substantial government interest, is it closely fitted? If you don't have a substantial government interest, sometimes you can't even do much about the closely fitted part. So that's how the first, the uh, 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 middle tier scrutiny is done. You need it in these cases, gender illegitimacy, and uh, when you use it, you look to see, identify the substantial governmental interest and see if the rule is closely fitted to it. And in both cases, you can make arguments here uh, as to what the interest, what the, uh, the governmental interest is, and is it a, a substantial governmental interest? And you can make an argument here as to whether or not the rule is closely fitted to achieving that purpose. Take the points here, make some kind of an argument in both places, and you'll get more points. Finally, down here, and then we'll go to our examples, to establish that, a, that you're using gender as a criteria, often there'll be points allocated on the exam on that issue. Uh, if the statute says, on its face, we're gonna treat women one way and men another, well, you know the criteria is gender, that's not a problem. But sometimes you have a statute that says uh, everyone must be off the streets by 11 o'clock at night, but only the women are getting arrested. Well, it's as practice. It really is just a law based on gender. And finally, if the law impacts women more than men, that by itself is not enough. You have to show, because laws, all, any demographic group you pick, the, the effect of a law on that group is probably going to be different. And so you have to show intent that the, the law was passed with the intent to discriminate against women, not just that it has more impact. Uh, so you use gender when, it's, when the classification scheme on its face says gender, as practice says gender, or you can prove that they just used a code word for gender uh, and that it really was intent to discriminate on gender. 
legitimacy. Uh, the issues that come up around uh, legitimacy are the reason the middle tier is used there is because when you think about it, the child who is born of this couple, so-called illegitimate child, this child had nothing to do with that. They, this child can't go back and make the man and woman get married. The child can't do anything about it. And so this child should not be victimized by society about something the child can do nothing about. And so any laws that tend to dump on, on uh, 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 those children is getting a, a stricter scrutiny, get middle tier scrutiny. You see it in the inheritance laws where sometimes these children cannot inherit from their father. Wrongful death statutes. Can the children sue for the wrongful death of the father? Can the father sue for wrongful death of the child? Adoptions, who's suing? Do you need both parents for that? Support rights. So that all these issues come up with these children, uh, or these non marital children, and that's when you also use this middle tier scrutiny. So at this point, we understand that you use middle tier scrutiny when the just classification scheme is based on gender or based on legitimacy. We understand that, the that in middle tier, the rule is that the government interest must be substantial and the rule must be closely related to achieving that substantial interest. Let us turn to some examples. Now, these are first on this board are the examples based on gender. And I've organized these examples based on gender into cases that relate to sort of personal matters and cases that really are institutional rules that ended up being uh, uh, challenged. The cases that are really related to more, now, now there's, no, there's, there's no difference in the standard or anything of that sort. This is just a way to help remember some of them. Nothing more than that. This doesn't show up as a part of the case law or anything. But the cases that deal with personal matters are things like alimony, pregnancy, statutory rape. In the alimony case, uh, we had an Alabama statute that said men pay alimony, women don't. And you say, what? Right here. Alimony paid by men only. And you say, okay, we're going to check this out under equal protection. What do we do? We say, is the classification scheme based on gender? Yes, men do one thing, women do another. So in that case, we're going to say, what is the important governmental purpose? And the government in that case said, our governmental purpose is to help the needy spouse. This is what Alabama said. Our purpose is to help the needy spouse. So this is a if that's their purpose to help the needy spouse, then uh, the question then becomes, is this a substantial governmental purpose or not? And I, I mean, maybe it is, maybe it's not. I don't know. You can put a one sense argument in there, but more important, even if this is a substantial governmental purpose, the rule that only males pay alimony is not closely fitted to helping the needy spouse. And the reason it's not is because the court pointed out that at these uh, divorce proceedings, the court has a whole lot of data about each person's financial situation. And so they'd know who's needy and who's not. And to have a broad rule that the men pay out of money but the women don't, the rule is not closely fitted to achieving this interest of helping the needy, even if it's an important governmental interest. Next example, pregnancy. This is the case, Good League versus Ailo. The first case was Orr versus Orr in Alabama. Uh, in uh, uh, Good League, the, uh, what happened is that California had a disability insurance policy program and people who worked would contribute to the, to the pool of money. Somebody was disabled, of course, the insurance would pay. But they excluded pregnancy as a disability for which the insurance program would pay. And uh, now, of course, if your person had some complications resulting from pregnancy, but we're talking about just an ordinary case where there are no 
significant complications that pregnancy was not treated, was not covered under the insurance policy. And so women sued saying uh, discrimination based on gender because only women can get pregnant. And the ruling was that now this discrimination was not really based on gender. It's based on whether you're pregnant or not, not whether you're female or not. After all, there are lots of females who are not pregnant and there's some who are. And so uh, since it was a, not a classification based on gender, it was based on being pregnant or not, rational basis applied and the court uh, upheld the, the, the rule saying that this private, this insurance policy, they can exclude pregnancy if they want to. They can exclude whatever medical conditions they want. Uh, statutory rape, Michael M. versus the Superior Court, Sonoma, California. This is a case where Michael, and Michael was a 17 and a half year old boy, and the girl uh, was a 16 and a half year old girl. And he was prosecuted for statutory rape uh, and argued that the statutory rape law was unconstitutional because it punished men but not, did not punish women. Well, if it punished men but did not punish women, then what we have to do, we're going to use middle tier scrutiny. If we're going to use middle tier scrutiny, then the, uh, the, the government needs to be served, a substantial governmental purpose and what is the substantial governmental purpose? Well, the, the purpose was the, the preventing teenage pregnancies. And is the law substantially related to achieving, achieving that purpose? That's the standard. Uh, preventing pregnancies and punishing the boy, is that substantially related to preventing pregnancy? Well, the court thought so, thought the answer was yes. Another example. This is the Missouri case I was telling you about, where the death benefits to widowers, they had, had to prove their, they only get them if they prove their dependency. And this was the case of Wrangler versus a druggist mutual insurance. And the, 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 uh, uh, the government itself said that the reason for this rule was the governmental purpose was administrative convenience. Remember that. Since they're using gender as a criteria for whether or not you got approved dependency, then what you want to do is you look at uh, is what is the what is the substantial governmental purpose? And they said our governmental purpose is administrative convenience. The court says that's not even a substantial governmental purpose, so you don't even get to substantial related part. Social Security Administration. Califano versus Webster. This is the case I was telling you about where the uh, Social Security Administration gave the women an extra, they could eliminate an additional three years of their lowest earnings. And the court said that was remedial. Being remedial is a substantial governmental purpose and that what they did for the women was closely related to what they were trying to remedy. Naval officer, this is Schlesinger versus Ballard. And this is a case where the U.S. Navy. U.S. Navy says, look, if you go nine, if you're a male in the Navy and you're an officer and you go nine years without promotion, you're out of the Navy. But if you're a woman, you can go 13 years without promotion before you're out of the Navy. And so here, obviously, men and women are being treated differently. The, uh, uh, and so, you know, again, you need to look at this right here. What is the substantial governmental purpose? And you would say the substantial governmental purpose in giving the women additional time here is fairness. Because they don't have as many opportunities for promotion as men do. They don't go to sea, for example, on the Navy vessels. And so the in a substantial governmental purpose is fairness. And is this closely related? Is it substantially related? And I would argue yes, that it is closely tied to achieving sense of fairness. Military dependency, this is a case Frontier versus Richardson, the case where uh, if you are the wife of a military person, you are presumed to be a dependent, and there are all kinds of dependency benefits that come with being the spouse of a military person. But if you are a husband and your wife is the in the military, 
then you have to prove your dependency. And obviously, men and women are being treated differently. Uh, the, the government did not have a substantial reason, uh, and, uh, and nor was this closely related to it. Military draft, uh, Rostker versus Goldberg. Uh, why we draft men, we do not draft women. And so the criteria for treating people differently is gender. You need a substantial governmental purpose. The substantial governmental purpose is the government is raising an army. And it's a combat army. And th there's a statute already in existence at the time that said women would not be put into combat, even if they were in the military. And so since they were raising, they were drafting people for combat soldiers, then that's a reason to leave the women out. They wouldn't. Uh, couldn't serve as combat soldiers. So you have an important governmental interest raising an army substantially related to, yes, the treating, not drafting women was closely related to that. All male prisons, this is Dothard versus Rawlinson. Um, this is um, the case where women wanted to work at the all male prison, the courts, and the uh, sheriff said no, and the argument was safety. The important governmental purpose was safety, and not hiring women was established as being closely related to that, because a lot of the men who were there were there for sexual offenses. It would just be too provocative. Schools, uh, the uh, Mississippi University for Women, uh, the court said, here the important governmental purpose, only purpose they had was continuing the stereotype image of women nurses. That's not an important governmental purpose. In VMI, U.S. versus Virginia, uh, Virginia says, we are training citizen soldiers. And the court says, well, even if you are training citizen soldiers, excluding women is not substantially related to that. Um, and finally comes the uh, Oklahoma case, Craig versus Bourne, where women could buy beer at age 18, but boys could, had to wait till age 21 to buy the beer. Obviously, the difference in treatment was on the basis of gender. And the courts, uh, the, and so you use middle tier scrutiny. The, using middle tier scrutiny here, uh, the, court, the uh, state's argument was that there, the important governmental purpose in making the men wait three more years to buy the beer was safety. And the state showed with data that men in that age group were 18 times more likely to be arrested for drunk driving than the women were. And therefore, making the men wait until three years later to buy beer was serving an important governmental interest, namely safety. And the court said, yeah, well, that's probably true. But the thing is that of all the people who are arrested for drunk driving, only 2% of people are arrested. But the other 98% have nothing to do with this. And so you're pen penalizing the 98% in order to get to the two that, that what you have done is you may have tried to promote safety. That's a lawful and important governmental purpose. But what you did is just too broad a stroke. It's not uh, narrowly tailored at achieving it so the law is void. Uh, finally, we have JEB versus Alabama. It's a jury case. What's interesting about that is that uh, this was a paternity case. And in the paternity case, uh, well, what the state did was they got rid of uh, uh, all the, the, uh, the, the men. Uh, they, they had 10 peremptory challenges. They used nine of their peremptory challenges to get men off the jury so they could have all women on the jury uh, because this was a paternity case and they felt like women would have more likely to, to you know, agree with the state in a paternity case than men would. And the court says that's uh, not rational. I mean, that, the, uh, that, that's... They were eliminating people on the jury on the basis of uh, gender, and you have to use, you apply the test, important governmental interest, not substantially related. Uh, so that's how, these are lots of examples. When you look at multiple choice questions, you look at old essay questions, you see that this is the stuff the bar examiners want you to know. One last thing we have here is uh, legitimacy. Uh, we have a number of examples where this issue comes up. First of all, there are some states that had a rule that said uh, you, uh, you've got one year or two years, or in this case, uh, 
in Clark versus Jeter, you got six years after the birth of the child to establish paternity. After that, you can't do it anymore. Well, that is uh, really, uh, uh, the court says, that's too short a statute of limitations. The child, who really has the greatest interest in this whole thing, isn't even old enough to protect his or her interest at, at that point. But these short statute of limitations to, to determine paternity uh, violate equal protection. They violate equal protection because you're now distinguishing between the people who got their paternity determined during this short period and the ones who didn't. And if this is how you classify people, what is that serving some important governmental purpose? The answer is no. No child support for illegitimate children, Texas versus Gomez. Uh, you see that you get child support for legitimate, but no child support for the non-marital child. Um, so therefore, you would use uh, military scrutiny. Important governmental purpose, I don't see one at all. Uh, the no consent of fathers for adoption. This is the case of Coven versus Mohammed. It's a New York case in which uh, the, the man and woman had had a child out of wedlock and, uh, be, and did not get married. But the father acknowledged the child and had a good relationship with the child. Well, the mother went on and got married. And after she got married, her new husband, her first husband, only one that she has in the problem, uh, wanted to adopt the child. And the biological father had a good relationship with the child. He said no. Well, New York had a law that says you don't need the consent of the, uh, of the father for an adoption in the case of a child born out of wedlock. The, the you know, illegitimate child, so to speak. And the court said, well, that, that law is, uh, violates equal protection because uh, it, you, you are uh, you're treating men and women differently and you need a substantial reason for treating them differently and this must be closely related to that and you won't make those standards. Uh, the no inheritance from the unacknowledged father. There are lots of these states that had, if you have an unacknowledged father, and the father dies, you don't, in the, the, the unacknowledged child, by non-marital child, is not in the, uh, is not, doesn't inherit anything. But these statutes are void unless there's some way in which the father can legitimize the child during lifetime. For example, it's the father can adopt the child. The father can just, the, the state will have some process where the father can go and acknowledge this is my child. So you have, if you have some way in which the father can acknowledge the child and therefore make the child in, in the, in the uh, distribution, that would be uh, okay. But if, you, if the statute doesn't have a provision for a way for the father to legitimize the child, those are void. Uh, there was a time when there was denial of public assistance to these uh, non-marital children that obviously uh, uh, you apply equal protection to that. The case of New Jersey welfare versus Cahill, and finally wrongful death. These cases where you can have the wrongful death of the mother, the father, or the child, and who can sue and who cannot sue. And the, obviously the mother should be able to sue. There's one statute that says that even the mother couldn't sue for the wrongful death of her illegitimate child. And of course, that's ridiculous. But can the father uh, sue if the father is acknowledged or unacknowledged? Can a child, if the child is, if, if the father dies, can the child sue for the uh, death of the unacknowledged father? And the way these statutes generally run is that if the child has been acknowledged by the father, then you give them all the rights of a child, of a, of a marital child. If the child has not been acknowledged, then you have to worry about fraud, and prevention of fraud is usually a legitimate governmental interest. So as long as you provide some way that the fathers can legitimize, you can have rules that prevent fraud. Now, you see how equal protection works, that basically, in summary, uh, that you, uh, middle tier equal protection requires that the government has a substantial governmental interest, and what they do is closely related to it. Uh, that you apply uh, this middle tier scrutiny whenever the criteria for forming the groups is gender or legitimacy. The, uh, 
we have lot, here on this board, we have lots of examples of how it has been applied in individual cases as well as in institutional cases. And if you look at uh, questions on the bar, you'll see this is where they come from. What we have here about legitimacy is also uh, easy to just apply the same rules. And that is really more than the bar examiners are going to require for you to know about uh, middle tier scrutiny and equal protection. You know this stuff and you use those two criteria, use those criteria, substantial governmental interest, substantially related. You do that and you should do very well on this type of question. That's the end of this lecture.